Hi everyone, today I'm going to repair an ignition lock cylinder from a 2004 Honda Civic. Honda has used this style of lock for most vehicles from the mid-2000s all the way to current model year. This is one of the most common repairs I do. There are a ton of these locks out there and they all have a common failure mode. I actually got this one halfway apart earlier and figured it would make a great video to show everybody how these fail and what we do to repair it. The first thing that we're going to need to do is remove the immobilizer ring and the switch assembly from the front to gain access to the lock. Uh, it's also important to note that you don't have to remove the complete housing. This just happens to be a referral from a shop and apparently they didn't know that we could repair these without them doing all this extra work and getting it out of the vehicle. But Let's begin. Both of these pieces up front are retained with a couple of Phillips headed screws. We'll get those out. There's the switch assembly. Now you can see the actual lock cylinder here. It's retained with a roll pin that's pressed into that hole. Now sometimes you get lucky and the register of that pin is so loose that you can just wiggle the ignition lock and that pin will fall out. But this one's in there pretty tight. I actually started drilling this earlier. I like to come in with a drill bit right here where the edge of the drill bit is lined up with the center line of that roll pin. The natural clockwise rotation of the drill bit will push the pin out when the cutting edge encounters it. Just like that. Save the pin. The actual lock cylinder has been removed. There is a spring in there. It's just being held in place with grease. You want to make sure that that doesn't go anywhere. Now that the lock cylinder is out, the next thing that we need to do is remove this sleeve. It's retained by another roll pin that's pressed in here. Now if you try and press this pin this way, it's going to encounter this and stop before it's all the way out. So I take a modified hook pick. I place it right there on the edge of the roll pen and just roll it in. It'll pop this out just enough to where you can grab the end that's protruding with the pair of side cutters. There we go. That's off. There's our sleeve. Okay, to actually get the plug out, we either need a pre-cut key or a lock decoding tool. I find that this works better in cases where the ignition is damaged because if you compare that to a pre-cut key, they usually always have a one and a one. It's very wide at the tip, and depending on how damaged the wafers are, that won't let the key go in. This pick, however, is doesn't have that feature in it, so insert the pick. Mm, this one is really damaged. They normally come out. There we go. Oh yeah. It's got an actual broken wafer. The key code is present and legible on this lock, so I don't need to worry about keeping track of the wafers or what numbers were on them in the case of the lock with an illegible key code or a key code not present. Let's see. 
gonna knock all the wafers out. The key code will give me all the information I need to code this lock without reading each wafer individually. That's another broken one. Yeah. Get the springs out. Another broken piece of wafer. You don't have to use new springs on these. I've never really had any issues reusing them, but it's so inexpensive, there's not really a reason not to install new components when you're going to this level. Okay, yeah, it looks like where these broken wafers were, they actually broke out the web in between those. We will probably wind up having to omit those wafers um, to avoid problems in the future, but that'll leave this with seven wafers and the vehicle is equipped with a transponder immobilizer system. So really all this is going to do is save wear and tear on the key and make the ignition last longer by not installing. There were two here that were totally broken. There was one back here. We can just omit those without jeopardizing the integrity of the lock. I'm going to take this out to the garage and clean it up with some parts cleaner and compressed air and I'll get back to you guys. Okay, the parts are all cleaned up. The next step is to code cut a fresh key. We've got a key blank loaded into the code cutting machine. I've already got the appropriate key code loaded and we're going to start. All right, all I've got to do now is flip the key over and run the same procedure on the other side. Next, we'll use this key to help verify that the wafers we install are appropriate for the key code. Okay, we've got our lock components cleaned up. We've got this loaded with white lithium grease and we have springs inserted in the pockets that will ultimately receive wafers. We've got a code cut key. We've got our wafers laid out in the order they need to be inserted. We're ready to start. The only thing that you need to be aware of when coding one of these ignitions is this is a four track high security key. We've got six cuts on either track. When you come over here, it would be logical to conclude that we've got positions one through six present in this lock, but that's not the case. The rear two pockets line up with this area on the key here, which is behind the first position. 
that is cut by default to a one depth on the key. Now, what we actually have present in the lock are cuts one through five. Five being this full size wafer over here, that is always a five or a three. Beyond that, at position six, the key is always cut to a one on both sides, both tracks. The important thing to realize here is if you've ever tried to duplicate one of these keys in an electronic decoding machine, code cutting machine, whatever you've got, if you fail to resolve the decoded information to a valid key code, go back to the tip four cuts. You're going to want to change this to a one, that to a one, this to a five and a five or a three and a five whatever have you. And when you modify those four tip cuts, you will 99% of the time come up with a valid key code and know you're on the right track. The other thing to note about the tip cuts are the potential for them to totally ruin your day in the worst way possible. Now, as the tip travels through the lock, it forces every wafer to this peak height right here. Now, there's no shutter on this lock. There's no provision to keep dirt, dust, grime, you know, whatever from entering it and accumulating in the pockets the wafers slide up and down in. Now, a customer could have a key that with significant wear on it that was working just fine in their car, and they approach you for a copy, you remove the valet lock, run the code that way, or modify the tip cuts and the bidding that was decoded, as I said. You arrive at a valid bidding. You code cut a perfect, shining, gleaming key that you're proud of. You take that key, you insert it into their ignition, and to your dismay, the ignition doesn't turn. In a panic, you pull the key out, you reinstall their worn key, and the ignition doesn't turn. What's happened is your fresh code cut key has these peaks present at the front. They've traveled through the whole lock. They've pushed wafers farther than they've been in a long time into areas of the pocket that may be packed with dirt and grime. There's nothing short of clamping vice grips onto the key, reverting to becoming a vice grip toting Neanderthal locksmith that could potentially fix this without breaking the whole ignition down and going through the whole process that's been laid out in front of you in this video. To avoid that situation and the unfathomable sadness that would ensue from having an angry, disgruntled customer trapped, stranded in close proximity to you, is after you come up with a valid key code, manually go in, modify the bidding, Cut these ones down to twos. That way, when those travel through the lock, they won't push the wafers as far, dramatically reducing the likelihood that any of them will stick. So that being said, let's begin. there. Okay, all the wafers are in. I'm going to insert the key. Looks like they're flush at the shear line. We know we've got the lock coded correctly. All right, we'll reinstall the sleeve and the roll pin.
All right. Looks good. All right, that works well. Now, there is another issue with this lock setup. It applies to certain housings, and this happens to be one of the housings that it applies to, where if you remove the ignition with a key inserted, or if you're careless when you do it, the sear on the back of the ignition, this piece right here, can latch on to the intermediate shaft in the housing and pull it forward past the steering wheel locking blade here. So if that happens, I can, it's not a big deal because the housing is removed. I can, you know what, actually, I'll just use a tool to pull it forward. You'll likely hear a click. Okay. Now, that shaft's been pulled forward past the steering wheel locking blade. Now that the ignition lock's reinserted, you'll find it won't turn. Nothing's wrong with the lock. It's an issue with the housing. There's an easy way to fix this. If the housing has been removed, you need to depress the steering wheel locking blade below flush. You'll hear that click and then all is well again. If this happens in the vehicle, uh, it's a little more complicated. You can remove the electric switch at the back of the housing and drill a small hole to gain access to the blade. And you can use a pick to pull the blade down if that happens. But that's basically it. Reinstall the roll pin, reinstall the switch assembly and the immobilizer rings and this job's complete. Okay, now that the lock's repaired, I thought I'd take a little moment here to show you guys up close exactly what wears out and fails in these locks. Right here, we've got a brand new wafer. If you notice this little peak here, that surface right here is what actually registers on the milled edge of the key. If you notice here, that's where all the wear occurs, and you can see from this wafer that's broken, that's pretty much gone. There's no amount of lube or magic pixie dust you can throw in these locks once they stop working to get them to turn again. They just need to be disassembled and rebuilt. Well, that's that. I hope uh, somebody out there learned something. If you have any questions, please leave a comment below.